Okay. So today's talk will be given by Ricardo Fukusawa, who has been a professor in CNO since 2009 and has worked in the areas of combinatorial optimization, operations research, mixed integer programming, and polyhedral combinatorics. Today, he will tell us about hardness of set partitioning formulation for the vehicle routing problem with stochastic demands. Ricardo. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending this talk. Um, so it's the first virtual talk that I give, so hopefully everything goes smoothly. Um, that's also maybe one nice advantage of being the first is whatever problems there is, it's just I'm the first one. So <laughs> uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so I try to, to give, uh, to, to let uh, sorry, the talk uh, not being too long also to, to maybe allow for uh, uh, for some questions. Um, so uh, I should say that this is a sort of joint work with uh, my the the MMAT student that, that I'm advising, Josh Gunter, uh, here uh, at Waterloo. Uh, and again, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Uh, just uh, send again a message to David to uh, if you have any questions. Uh, it would be good to to see if uh, I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer as best as I can. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. So uh, I'm going to start by introducing sort of a motivation for the problem um, and this particular type of formulations that I'm that I'm interested in in talking about, which is the set partitioning type formulations. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, the problem, the vehicle routing problem with stochastic demands, so the VRPSD. Um, I'll define briefly what the problem is, uh, and then I'll go over a few uh, cases of the problem, um, and particularly that that essentially amounts to to what what are the distributions of of the random variables uh, that are involved in this problem. Okay, and then and then I'll conclude at the end. Okay, so. Here is uh, the motivation. <clears throat> so the, the, the deterministic vehicle routing problem, it's, it's a classic combinatorial optimization problem. Um, and it's given as follows. Uh, I have this uh, undirected graph, uh, G equals to uh, VE. Uh, and my set of vertices, it has a special vertex called the depot. So that's the vertex zero here, uh, that's the depot. Uh, the V plus is the set of clients that I have uh, in my problem. Uh, and the goal is to serve the clients, right? So what do I have? I have edge lengths, uh, LE for every edge. Um, I'm given fixed number uh, K of vehicles. Uh, they're uh, homogeneous, so they're all the same vehicles. They're identical vehicles. Uh, and they have a given capacity Q. And the goal is to find a set, uh, a set of K routes uh, that minimizes the total length, right? Where the length is just, again, the sum of the lengths of the edges. And so for the deterministic version of the problem, what I have is I have client demands DI uh, for every client, right? And so what do we want? I want that if, let's say, SJ is the set of clients that are served by a particular route J, then what do we want? We want that the sum of the demands of that route that, that are served by that route, right? So D of SJ, that has to be at most the capacity, right? So for instance, this would be a solution to this problem. There are four different routes. Uh, each one serves uh, this this green one serves the, these clients on the right, the red one serves these clients on top, and so on, right? Uh, I need to serve, or sorry, I need to visit every client exactly once, right? And I need to leave and enter the depot K times, right? Because I have K routes. Okay, so, I mean, it, it looks a bit like, like the TSP in, in the sense that I want to visit everybody once except the depot. Uh, and it also has sort of components of, of knapsack problem, right, involved in it, right? Because again, this is a knapsack constraint that uh, I want that the sum of the demands that I'm serving 
uh, is at most this, uh, this capacity of the knapsack T. Okay, so that's a classic deterministic vehicle routing problem. It's been studied for over 50, 60 years. Um, so what is it, uh, the, 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 the assumption that we're gonna be making today? It's, the thing is this, this uh, assumption that the client's demands are known in advance, the client's demand DI, it's usually not true, right? It's, it's something you're trying to plan your routes uh, and, and you, don't, you don't actually know what the demands are. Right? And oftentimes you need to plan your routes in advance uh, without actually knowing what the demands are going to be. Okay, oh, so that's the, 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 the variation of the problem that we're gonna be looking at, is we're gonna look at demands. Now the demands, instead of being this small DI, which are given numbers, they're gonna be capital DI, which are random variables. And these random variables, they only get realized after the routes have been decided. Right, so the first thing that I need to do is decide which routes I'm going to take based on uh, whatever knowledge I have from these random variables. Afterwards, then uh, I, after I decide the routes, then I know exactly what the realizations of these demands are. Okay, so that's the basic uh, premise of the vehicle routing problem with stochastic demands. So the question is what happens, right? These, since these are not uh, given fixed numbers anymore, uh, there is a possibility that this, this capacity is exceeded, right? So I, I, maybe I planned uh, looking at, let's say expected values here, uh, but it turns out that I was unlucky. The random variables got realized in such a way that I exceed my capacity. So what do I need to do when the sum of the loads that I serve exceeds my capacity? So there are two uh, more studied approaches to, 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 to what to do in these cases. One is the two-stage uh, approach, and the second is the chance constraint approach. Um, so the two-stage approach is as follows. It's based on, on sort of a recourse action. So what is it that we're doing? So I decided in the first stage, so I decided in advance which are the routes that I'm going to take. So these are the sort of the, the the dashed line here is that's, I plan the route so that, uh, and I'm doing it so that the total expected demand does not exceed the capacity, right? So that's, uh, that's what I did here. And now what I'm going to do after I see what the exact realization is of the demands, I follow the planned route. So I'm going along, let's say this red route here. Um, and then all of a sudden I stop here and then I see, well, the capacity is actually exceeded at this customer. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to determine uh, an alternative service plan, right? So what is it that usually is uh, I'm going to do? I'm going to sort of go back and forth in this vertex, right? So I'm gonna make this return trip so I can, let's say, refill or empty my truck and go back here and then continue my trip, right? And then I can do the same thing for every route. So I start following the sort of the blue route here, uh, and then I stop here, and then uh, I'll go back and forth, uh, and then I'll continue. Okay, um, so that's sort of the, the more common assumption of, the, of this recourse. And then every single one of these, these return trips gives me an extra cost, right? So I'm, I had planned this route here, now I'm going back and forth. Uh, I'm paying this extra cost, right? So that happens for some particular realization of the demands. Uh, so what do I want to do? I want to minimize the expected cost, right? So each one of these gives me some cost uh, with some associated probability. And that means uh, total gives me an expected cost. So the recourse based model plans to minimize the expected cost. Um, there are other options of recourse action, actions that people have studied, but they are more expensive computationally. Like, yeah, well, once you've seen what the actual demands are, maybe you, you wanna do it optimally. Uh, maybe you wanna refuel early on or, or, and so on. Uh, but those are more expensive computationally, so I'm not gonna go over that. I'm gonna assume that I'm minimizing uh, the expected cost. Okay. Um, the second approach to, to dealing with the stochastic demands is what's called a chance constraint. It essentially, uh, what uh, they want to do is, well, I'm gonna limit the likelihood that the capacity uh, is uh, exceeded. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm going to say that the probability doesn't exceed this threshold epsilon that's given as an input parameter. Um, and if it happens that, that it does exceed, I'm just going to ignore. I'm, I'm not going to count it. So I'm just going to minimize uh, the, the deterministic cost uh, and trying to prevent it, prevent this, this uh, failure to happening uh, with, uh, with a high probability. Okay, so those are the two sort of different paradigms that people have studied uh, with respect to the VRP with stochastic demands. Right, so this is formally what is, uh, what is defined as the chance constraint. Okay, so that th those two approaches to me are a little bit uh, sort of complementary, right? So if you look at the chance constraint, uh, the advantage of the trans constraint is that it gives you a more robust approach, right? Because uh, you're controlling the probability that something bad happens to you. Uh, but uh, the con of it is that, well, it, it, once those bad things happen, it can be catastrophic, right? It can be very costly. Uh, the chance constraint completely ignores that. Uh, the two-stage approach, it's the complement of that. Essentially, it just considers the expected cost. Uh, but ignores the robustness. So if maybe it's a better expected cost to actually be violating your, your uh, capacity, I don't know, 50% of the time, right? Which is not something that's uh, too desirable. Um, so overall, uh, what I really want to ultimately end up doing is uh, combining the two approaches. And I think that is doable for at least this type of problem. Uh, it's not something that you've seen often in the literature uh, overall for a, even for like specific combinatorial optimizations. So that's, uh, that's sort of the theme that, that I want to actually eventually get to. Um, I've already worked on the chance constrained version of the same problem um, in a previous work. Um, and so the goal of this particular work is to actually just study the two stage uh, VRP with stochastic demands. Okay, so from now on, when I'm referring to the VRP with stochastic demands, I mean the, the two-stage version, right, where I'm just minimizing the expected cost. So again, this is uh, probably also a good time. If you have any questions, uh, just uh, again, just uh, let David know. Um, that's sort of the main motivation for the problem. Okay, so otherwise, uh, let me continue. Um, so the, the integer programming formulations that are most successful for uh, several variants of the routing problem, they are based on this uh, so-called set partitioning type formulations, right? And these are just a, a few of the, uh, the literature review, right? The first one is for the, the, the classic capacitative vehicle routing problem, the deterministic version that I presented before. Um, then there's versions for uh, when you have time windows, which you need to serve customers within a time window. Uh, there are pickup and delivery versions of the problem. Um, and there's the chance constraint version that I just mentioned as well. And there's many other variants for which uh, the most successful, and when I say most successful, it means uh, the one of the approaches that can sort of solve the largest benchmark instances in practice um, within a certain time window. Right. Uh, so those are the, the, the most uh, sort of promising approaches computationally is the one that are based on this uh, set partitioning type formulations. OK, so that's why we wanted to study uh, this also for the VRP with stochastic demands. OK, so what are these uh, these set partitioning formulations? So these set partitioning formulations are as follows. Um, so let me call omega the set of all feasible routes, right? So the, the things that sort of leave the depot, visit a certain subset of clients and come back to the depot. So I'm gonna associate one variable, I'm gonna call it lambda r, to every element of that set, right? As that set of feasible routes. Um, so CR is just the cost of that route, right? And this is, by the way, this is just a formulation for the deterministic version of the problem. Right? So CR is just the cost of that route. So, so I'm just minimizing that. I'm having a binary variable saying if I use that route or not. Right? This constraint just says that I'm picking K routes out of the total possible I need to pick K. 
And this constraint says that I need to visit every client exactly once, right? So this AIR parameter is the number of times that a vertex appears in the route, right? It's either zero or one. So I'm going to pick out of all the routes that visit a certain customer exactly one of them, right? So exactly, uh, so every customer is visited exactly once. So it's a simple formulation. Um, and that's, that's essentially the basis of a lot of the, the the most successful approaches. So uh, yeah, I think as I mean, people have looked at this. Uh, I think in, in approximation algorithms, they use uh, some formulations of this type. Not necessarily. I don't know for for this particular problem, but it's I mean, this idea of, of having a huge number of variables is usually called I think the configuration LP. Uh, this is, I mean, it can be seen as a dense equal for formulation as well in some context. So, I mean, there's, there's several different names that, that you can uh, you can find this type of formulation around, right? But as I mentioned, this omega is the set of feasible routes is a huge number of variables there, right? So it's an exponential number of variables in the size of the input. So how do you even solve this problem? Right, so easily, well, I just solve the LP relaxation and do branch and bound. That's the basic uh, idea of how to solve this problem. But the LP relaxation has an exponential number of variables. So how do you solve even the LP relaxation of the problem? Right, so let's look at uh, the LP relaxation of the problem here, right? It's just essentially the same, except that I'm just having non-negativities on uh, the lambda variables. Right, so what do we do? We start with some subset uh, of the feasible route, some omega bar, uh, that uh, has a much smaller cardinality than the total number of routes that I, that I could possibly have. So just something that, that can get us started. Right, and what do we do? I solve this problem with only those omega bar set of variables. Right, so that's a little bit more under control. And this is an LP, so I get this uh, dual variables associated to each one of the constraints. So the alpha i is the constraints associated to these first set of constraints. The alpha zero is the ones associated to the second set of constraints, uh, which is actually just a single constraint, so this is just a single variable, right? So now I can actually compute the reduced cost of any variable uh, by the way, any variable, even on uh, the set omega, right? I can say that this is potentially uh, essentially a solution to the problem where everybody that's outside of omega bar is just set to zero, right? But now I can still compute the reduced cost of everything that's not been included in this LP, which is just what, right? This just basic LP is just the original cost CR minus the coefficient in the constraint matrix times the dual variable coefficient the constraint matrix in the second constraint is just one. So that's the reduced cost of any variable, right? So what do we have? Well, if this reduced cost is greater or equal to zero, then I get actually an optimal solution for my original linear program, right? And this reduced cost can be greater or equal to zero. That's equivalent to saying I minimize, I find the route of minimum reduced cost. That has to be greater or equal to zero, right? So if I find the route of minimum reduced cost and that's greater or equal to zero, then I've actually solved my original LP. If not, then I've just found a route with negative reduced cost. So I can add that to my set omega bar and then I'm just gonna iterate, right? And that's a process that's called uh, dynamic, dynamic column generation, okay? So that's how you solve this uh, linear programming relaxation of this problem. Um, and with that, then, then you can sort of just start the branch and bound process, okay? But the key thing here is that we're gonna be focusing on is how easy is this problem to solve, right? Now I, what I want to solve is I'm given this costs, reduced cost C bar. I want to find the, the route that has the minimum reduced cost. So that's uh, what's called the pricing problem, right? So this is the pricing problem. Uh, that's what I want to solve to be able to solve that linear program. So how do I do that? I'm just gonna rewrite this in a more convenient way. So let me say that QRE is the number of times a particular edge appears in a route. Um, 
And it's again, very easy to see that, well, AI, uh, A-R-I, uh, so the number of times a vertex appear in a route, it's just, I sum all the edges that are incident to a given vertex and divide it by two, right? So if it appears in a route, there's two edges incident to it. So this is gonna be two, two divided by two, that's one. So the vertex is gonna appear in a route. Otherwise, this is gonna be zero, so then it cancels out, right? So then I can just rewrite my reduced cost in this way, right? The cost of a route is just the sum of the lengths of, well, the number of times the edge appears, it's either zero or one, right? Now I can rewrite this ARI as this expression, right? And then again, this is just, um, just this expression here, right? Every route visits the, uh, the, the, the depot twice, so that's sum here is equal to one. Uh, so that's the expression of the reduced cost of route. Um, and now I can essentially decompose this, right? I can actually set this age E to be the cost of edge E. And then essentially this reduced cost just becomes the sum over all edges uh, of this new cost age E times the number of times this edge appears in a route. Okay, so just I just rewrote the, the, the reduced cost of each route, right? So well, the pricing problem, what it essentially means is that I just need to be able to find the least cost route with respect to these new costs HD, okay? So now that's, that's the problem that I'm gonna be focusing on for, from the, uh, this point on, is I'm going to look at some arbitrarily given costs HE, um, and then I wanna be able to find this minimum uh, minimum cost route subject to these costs. Okay. Um, by the way, this is because of how this age E comes about, right? This age E is, is just this, this expression here. Uh, so there is no assumption on triangle inequality or anything like that, right? This, what, even if the original cost satisfied triangle inequality, right? They were Euclidean or, or anything like that. Um, these modifications of the cost may start violating that. Right? So these, these AG costs, they're arbitrary, they can be positive, negative, and so there, there can be no assumption on anything, um, that, on any property that AG satisfies. Okay, so the problem now is that, well, the problem is solving this pricing problem is strongly NP-hard, right? So which means that even solving the LP relaxation that I wanted is uh, strongly NP-hard. Uh, which means that I've just exchanged the problem of solving a strongly anti-hard problem, which was the original one, uh, with just actually solving just the LP relaxation. is It's as hard as solving the original problem from scratch, right? So there's, uh, it didn't help much. Um, so how do we do it in the deterministic pricing setting? So all we do is this following. Um, Instead of considering a route, which is just essentially a closed walk starting and ending at the depot, uh, such that the total capacity is respected and the customers are visited at most one, right? So in other words, I never repeat a vertex in this sequence uh, of vertices in a route. I'm just gonna eliminate that, right? I'm going to eliminate the assumption that customers are visited at most once, right? So essentially I'm allowing cycles to happen, right? So Instead of a route, I'm gonna call this a walk or, or I'm gonna actually gonna call this a queue route, uh, which is essentially allowing cycles to happen, right? So this is, for example, it's gonna be a queue route. Uh, by the way, a queue route can be a route. So a queue route without cycles, which is actually a route, but I'm just gonna uh, sort of refer to it as an elementary route to make it more explicitly when it, I, I, I wanna make sure it doesn't have cycles. Okay, so now what do we do for the deterministic version of the problem? I'm gonna do the same thing, right? I'm gonna solve the exact same uh, linear program, except that instead of saying, uh, I'm considering only the set of feasible routes, I'm just considering the set of feasible Q routes. Uh, all the parameters are the same as before, right? And now notice that at any feasible solution to the integer program, so when lambdas are zero and one, all the Q routes that are used, they have to be elementary, right? Because otherwise a vertex appears twice here uh, and two times any integer number that's one, that's never gonna add up to one. 
right? So at integer solutions, I get exactly the same set of solutions, right? But uh, the LP relaxation is what changes, okay? Well, but then what I gain from that is that now I can actually find the minimum cost Q route in pseudo polynomial time, right? So it's a knapsack uh, type uh, dynamic programming recursion that I can do, right? So all I need to say is I'm going to try to find the minimum cost Q route that finishes at a given vertex using a capacity at most G, right? And so if that's sort of the reduced cost of that, right? So C bar of VG, all I need to look at is saying, well, I want to find the smallest route that I can use before, right? So I finish at a vertex U using capacity G minus DV plus whatever new cost that I had. Um, and then I'm just going to apply this dynamic programming recursion over and over again, right? And this allows me to find the minimum cost Q route, right? And that's, so it's weakly MP hard. Um, it has a order of uh, n squared Q complexity. Um, and that's what I said before, is that uh, all integral solutions will be elementary. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay. So let's look now at the, the VRP with stochastic demands, particularly the, the two-stage version, right, that I'm interested in looking. Um, so by the way, this is just a, a, a sort of a brief literature review of things that have been done for this problem for the two-stage version. There's been several heuristics. There have been some uh, uh, problem formulations based on, on just uh, the regular edge formulation for this problem uh, and some uh, formulations based on exponential number of variables, just like I mentioned. Um, that's for the two stage. And then again, some similar type of, of literature that has happened for the chance constraint version. But actually uh, pretty much all of the, the two stage approaches that have been exact approaches, they rely on strong assumptions on the demand. So the, either they're independent random variables and or they have a particular distribution like a normal distribution. Uh, oftentimes it's actually both. Okay, so here is uh, what I want to do. Uh, so this is the problem. So I'm gonna actually assume that I have a complete graph uh, and I actually, it should be sort of, uh, I'm sorry about that. It should be actually directed because now uh, it matters sort of where I'm going, right? In which direction I'm going, uh, but pretty much everything else applies. Um, so I have edge lengths LE now, again, K vehicles, capacity. Now I have random demands. Now I need to say, what is it that uh, I'm, I'm minimizing. So given a route or even a Q route, uh, I'm gonna define it to be feasible essentially if the sum of the expected values is at most uh, the capacity, sorry, this should be Q not B. Uh, so the sum of the expected values at most Q. The first stage cost is exactly what it was before, right? It's just the sum of the edge lengths. Now the second stage cost is what? Is the expected cost due to failures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to define this uh, DRI variable to be essentially the sum of the random demands from the beginning of the route up until the ith vertex of that route, right? So this is uh, the sum of the expected demands. So then the expected failure cost at the ith vertex is this, right? So this is essentially, if I look uh, what is this is saying? Let's assume, forget about this sum for a bit. Let's assume that u equals to one. All I'm saying is the probability that <clears throat> uh, the sum of all demands up to the i minus one -th vertex uh, didn't exceed the capacity um, and it exceeds now at vertex i, right? So it didn't exceed the capacity before, but it does exceed it now. Right, so if that event happens, then I have to do a back and forth trip to, to the depot, right? So that's exactly what this is counting. I'm counting twice times this back and forth trip times this probability that the first failure happened, right? If we consider u equals one, uh, but then I can see and, and see if it happens the second time and the third time and so on, right? So I can do this uh, however many times is needed, this back and forth trip. Uh, so that's what I'm defining as my expected failure cost. 
Okay, so the second stage cost, this, the total expected cost of my route is just the sum of all these expected failure costs. Okay, um, and so the key problem is that, well, what is the, the total two stage cost of my route is just the sum of the first stage cost and the second stage cost. So the key problem for set partition is exactly that, is the finding this Q route of least total first and second stage cost, right? So again, if I can do that, then I can apply pretty much the same ideas that I did for the deterministic version of the problem uh, to the two-stage problem uh, that I've just described, okay? Uh, and so that's what I'm going to be looking at is, well, how hard is it to solve this problem? So um, one thing that's uh, not clear is it's not even very easy to know even the distribution of some of random variables. Even if I know that, uh, that these uh, demands have some known distribution, uh, it's uh, sum of two known distributions is not necessarily easy to compute. Um, so even calculating the second stage cost may be hard. Um, that's why a lot of people do this assumption that, that the demands are independent normal, because if it's independent normal, the sum of independent normals is again, just a normal distribution. Um, I found that a little too restrictive because it's not often the case where, first of all, independence uh, is, is, uh, is a, to me, independence is the, the big problem here. Um, what I'd like to answer also is that uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to answer the case also when the demands are given as just a finite set of scenarios, right? So scenario one just gives me uh, the total demands for every single customer. Scenario two, again, just gives me a, se a set of uh, demands for the all customers again, right? So each one is a particular scenario. Each one happens with a given probability. Uh, and then I can just calculate the total demand, right? So it's a finite discrete distribution, essentially. Uh, by the way, the second uh, approach of scenarios, it can be used to approximate a given true distribution. There are sort of some sampling results uh, that with enough samples, uh, you can approximate this. Uh, the, so this with enough samples, uh, maybe a quite large number of scenarios, but, uh, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's something that people have used before. It's called like sample average approximation and so on. So that's gonna be the two cases that I'm gonna be focusing on, right? These, the, this independent or normal assumption and the scenario assumption. And so these are the main results that we have, uh, that we have uh, shown is that uh, with these two assumptions on the demand distributions, uh, what was a weekly NP-hard problem, so there was a pseudo polynomial time algorithm to solve, is uh, not quite right anymore, right? Uh, so these, uh, the, just the computation of the two stage costs make the problem uh, transition to being a much harder problem to solve. Uh, that's not too surprising if you're familiar with a lot of things uh, on stochastic uh, programming. That's uh, oftentimes what happens when you just consider uncertainty, things start becoming a lot more complex, right? Um, but again, this is just um, the, the, the thing we wanted to, to try to see how do you solve this, okay? Um, so I'm gonna start with just the finite discrete distribution case. That's a, a little bit easier to do. Um, so all we're gonna show, we're gonna show that in this case, we can, if we can solve this minimum cost uh, Q route problem, then we can solve Hamilton and Cycle, right? So let me consider um, this given graph, and I wanna figure out if it has a Hamiltonian cycle. So I'm gonna construct this instance of my minimum two-stage cost Q route. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna define this, uh, these uh, fixed given edge lengths as following. Uh, the initial edge lengths uh, from uh, vertices that are adjacent to the depot, it's just gonna be n cubed. Uh, all other edges that exist in this graph are just gonna get a cost of minus one. And then this is how I'm going to set these distributions. I'm gonna set one scenario for every possible uh, client that I have. So the probabilities is just one over N. And this is gonna be the demand distribution for this given scenario. Uh, the given scenario distribution for um, so the demand for vertex J is gonna be N 
for scenario J and one for every other scenario, right? So if you sum all the demands in a given scenario, you get uh, essentially 2n minus one, right? Which is exactly my capacity. So if I look at a scenario and I look at a route, the sum of the demands is 2n minus one, right? So it's not too hard to argue that if you have some elementary routes, then the second stage cost is zero, right? So elementary routes essentially start at a depot, visit some vertex, and then after a while goes back to the depot without having any cycles. Um, I want to argue that doesn't violate any scenario, and that's easy because any elementary route is going to at most visit every single vertex, and that's never going to violate the capacity, right? The total capacity that I can use, even if I use all vertices, is at most 2n minus 1, right? So the second stage cost is zero for elementary routes, whereas if you have a non-elementary route, so if you have cycles, it means you're visiting one of these vertices twice, right? And that's already adds up to 2n. So that means that that particular vertex already, since you visited it twice, you're exceeding the capacity. So you need to make this back and forth trip to the depot. So you're incurring this cost of n cubed. Um, and you're incurring this cost of n cubed with this uh, probability 1 over n. So that incurs a total second stage cost of n squared, right? So non-elementary routes have high cost. Elementary routes have zero second stage cost, right? So what you can get is that at the end of the day, you're going to get an elementary route uh, when you minimize, uh, when you find a minimum cost Q route, right? Uh, also, you can note that, uh, again, a Q route is feasible if and only if it has length at most n, right? And that's essentially what did I define as feasibility is just that the expected value the sum of the expected demands is at most the capacity. Um, but you can figure out that, again, the expected demands of every single vertex is essentially you have uh, one scenario where it's n and uh, n minus one scenario is where it's one. And that's divided by n, right? Because you have one scenario for every one of these. Uh, and so that gets to be 2n minus one divided by n. That's the expected value of the demand of every guy, right? And so it has less uh, length at most n because it cannot be more than 2n minus 1, right? So that's, again, just uh, pretty much an observation, right? It's just a one-line proof. It should maybe not even be called a lemma. Right, so, but, uh, well, with these two things, when then we can just pretty much argue that any minimum two-stage Q route cost must be elementary. Uh, essentially, we've seen that the second stage cost cannot be too high, um, but then we can also see that you're never going to be able to pick up enough of these guys, right? That's, that's the only reason why we maybe uh, would want to, to have a non-elementary route, because it's more expensive uh, with respect to the second stage cost, but maybe we might pick up some, some, a lot of these edges here to make up for that. But since we cannot uh, pick up too many of these because we can visit at most n guys, we will never be able to make up for that. So at the end of the day, uh, you have to get an elementary route. Um, so that means that uh, at the end of the day, you can have a Hamiltonian cycle if and only if the minimum two-stage cost is a Hamiltonian cycle, right? Because again, once you've visited some guy here, then you want to pick up as many of these edges as possible, right? Um, once you've left the depot, you want to pick up as many of these edges as possible. And so if, if you can do it picking up all the edges, then, then you get a Hamiltonian cycle, right? So that shows, again, strong NP hardness of the problem. <clears throat> okay. Um, any questions? So that, that's uh, pretty much uh, the, 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 the proof for the, the scenario case. Uh, and now uh, let me go over the sort of the independent normal case. So it's the, the definition of the problem is exactly the same. The assumption now is that the demands are normal, independent. Uh, now the question is again, can we get a pseudo polynomial time algorithm to find uh, this minimum two stage cost Q route, right? Why do we think that maybe we can do that, right? Well. First of all, I mean, a couple of things to note is that if the demands are independent, then the sum of the demands is independent. 
uh, with mean u1 plus mu2, and the variance is sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared. Um, and there is a pseudo polynomial time algorithm to solve this problem when the variances are zero, right? That's exactly the deterministic case. So that uh, in that case, we get a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. Um, what does the algorithm do? It keeps track essentially of the cumulative demands on a Q route, right? That's the, what the deterministic algorithm does. And in fact, these guys, uh, Christensen and Lisgar, they did uh, exploit pretty much a similar idea to try to do it for this case, for the independent normal case. And what they do is they devise an algorithm that essentially keeps track of not only the cumulative mu's, but all the cumulative mu's and variances. And it works for elementary routes. And uh, it, the way it's sort of described, uh, if you can extend it to, to working it for the, the, the minimum two-stage Q routes, it would be pseudo-polynomial, okay? So that's why I mean, maybe there is a hope of actually getting something that works in this case. Um, but it actually doesn't. Um, why is it, uh, so first of all, what is the, the, the problem uh, that, that these guys have? They, they propose an approach. Why does it only work with, with elementary routes? So let me just give you this small illustrative example here. Um, Suppose that you have uh, these guys, uh, you have only four clients, their demands are all normally distributed, independent, right? Uh, with this normal with a mean 100, variance is 200. This is the capacity, all the edge costs are one. If I look at this route here from zero to three, um, so zero, three, and then two, and then one, and then go back here, the cumulative demand at the third vertex on the route, so zero, three to one at this vertex here, that's the cumulative demand. So it's uh, 300 and 600, right? All I'm doing is adding up the means and adding up the variances. And then you can compute the expected second stage cost is gonna be essentially this number, right? 0.7 something. But if I get this instead, instead of starting by visiting three, I can actually start by visiting one and then two and then back to one and then zero. In principle, I should have done the same thing, right? So I'm visiting exactly the same number of vertices. Um, so I should be just adding means and variances, right? So I should have, again, distributed as N 300, 600, but it's actually not, it's actually a thousand because this, this fact that it's independent, it's a little bit fake, right? It's independent if I look at client one and client two, but I visited client one once, right? So I'm, if I visited client once twice in this route, that's actually not independent of the first visit of client one, right? That has, it's actually, it's 100% correlated with the first visit. Um, so the demand distribution of client one, so the second guy in the route, is 100% correlated with the third guy in the row, right? And that's the one that's gonna increase our variance. And therefore I get a, an incorrect expected uh, second stage cost, okay? So that's where their, their algorithm fails and it gets things wrong. Um, so that's what we wanted to show is that, well, we started trying to see, well, how can we get rid of that? And we started figuring out, well, well maybe it, it, we cannot do it. Well, maybe it's strongly and be hard. Um, that's what we wanted to do. Uh, let me rephrase that in, the, in terms of the proof. Uh, what did we try to do? Uh, we tried to do the following. Let's say, suppose that there exists a polynomial time algorithm to solve this problem, right? Under these assumptions. Uh, all the data is integer, right? So the mu's and the sigma squared and the capacity, there's integers and they're polynomially bounded on the, the size of the graph. All the original fixed edge costs, they're again polynomially bounded, right? Then I would get a polynomial time algorithm to solve Hamilton and cycle, right? So if I can prove this, then I prove essentially strong empty hardness, right? That, that's, that's one way to do it, okay? Um, there are a couple of issues here, right? Uh, it's not even clear how to compute the second stage cost though, because uh, again, the normal variables, they are uh, continuous distributions and so on. So uh, the probabilities can actually be some real numbers. It's not entirely clear how easy or hard it is to do that. So we needed to, to put this extra assumption that all basic operations 
on any real numbers can be done essentially in constant time. Um, that's uh, not too, too bad of an assumption. A lot of times the, these proofs of, of, of hardness uh, sort of assume these, this, this basic model of computation. Uh, but uh, again, we needed to put this extra caveat there. So let's try to prove that. Um, so that's the proof idea. Um, all I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to compute this R fail, which is going to be the expected number of failures of a, of a normal random variable with mean mu invariant sigma squared, right? It's essentially the expression that I wrote before. Uh, we need to argue that this is actually some number that, uh, that's, that's given. So it, it, this is a, a given number. This sum doesn't diverge. Uh, that's relatively easy to do. Um, uh, you also, we, we needed to some monotonicity argument that if we increase the, 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 the mean or we increase the variance, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this quantity also increases. And those two can be done just by essentially looking at the, the CDFs of these normal distributions. Um, but then it comes the reduction, right? So the reduction is essentially as follows. Um, I'm given a graph. I want to find a Hamiltonian cycle in it. So all I'm going to do is actually defining normal variables that are distributed with means and variances equal to one. So it's actually not even polynomially bounded, it's constant. Um, the capacity is again a constant, so I'm achieving what I wanted. But then I need to define these costs here, right? This mn is this uh, number here that depends on this, uh, this expression that I calculated before. Uh, it's not too important, so don't worry too much about it. And there, there is also this Wn large constant there that, again, it can be computed based on this R fail for mu's and sigma squares that are O of n, right? Um, and then you can set the costs in this way, which, again, is not the entirely uh, important because I'm going to omit pretty much all the details. Essentially, but, but the idea is, again, I'm setting up the costs in a way that non-elementary routes, they're more expensive than elementary Right? And also in the way that you'd want to use as many edges as possible, just like I did in the scenario version. Okay? So if I do that, then, uh, <clears throat> and then again, the key difficulty is working out bounds to see how much uh, these operations would affect the cost and how much the expected cost gets affected. Uh, but those are technical detail that I'm sort of just omitting here. But then pretty much I'm done, right? That, that's pretty much what I wanted to do is now if I can do that, then, uh, then there is a threshold and we can prove that there is this threshold for which uh, G has a Hamiltonian cycle if and only if when I solve the problem, uh, the minimum cost has value at most gamma, right? So great, pretty much seems like I've solved the problem. Um, there is a small caveat though. The caveat is this, is that all of these are depending on this MN or on these R fail quantity here. Um, so this assumption is actually not entirely true. I'm actually, we're actually not sure that it's entirely true. We were just not able to prove that these, these values are polynomially bounded on M, right? Um, but that's essentially the result that we can, we can say. And also, it's not even clear that we, I mean, how we compute this number uh, if it can be done in polynomial time, right? Uh, so we had to add these two caveats there. And that's pretty much uh, sort of the, as harder a proof that, that, that we, we managed to do. Uh, we're hoping to get rid of uh, probably a few of these, but I'm not sure that that uh, will succeed. Um, but uh, I think at least this, this gives some indication that this problem seems to be a bit harder uh, than what it looked at at the beginning. Um, so one particular thing, right? What this is saying is, again, if I get small mu, sigmas, and q's, um, then I get a polynomial time algorithm for, for the Hamiltonian cycle. Uh, so, but I can still have large costs, right? Um, you have to contrast that, for example, with a knapsack problem where I can have large weights or large costs as long as one of them is polynomially bounded, then I can still get a polynomial time algorithm to solve in knapsack. Okay? Um, so this says that at least in terms of the weights, this is not possible, right? So if, if there is something that exploits this, it has to exploit the fact that, that you get large costs in here, right? And also it seems to imply that, that again, 
the the extension that that seemed to be possible from the 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 the, the algorithm that these guys proposed back the, back in two thousand and seven is also not possible because their extension would essentially uh, be polynomial time if these guys are polynomial proper, right? So it would contradict this result, right? So while it's not really what we set out to do to say actually, I mean, strong NP hardness. Uh, it does give at least some hardness indications, right, of, of, of how this, how hard this problem is. Um, I still believe that the problem is strongly NP-hard, uh, but, uh, well, or at least, again, under these, these caveats of, of computing, I guess, any, any of these operations, uh, you know, of one time, um, but it's, it's not entirely clear. Um, the proof doesn't actually show that at the moment, okay? Um, so that was pretty much what I wanted to 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 do is go over the, these hardness results, right? So this says essentially that that I mean those set partitioning formulations that I mentioned, they're a little bit uh, hopeless. Um, so what are the takeaways that I wanted you to 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 come out uh, from this talk, right? One is that well, it is important to study the, these formulations. It's pretty much uh, been the benchmark for several of the routing problems. Um, just adding the fact that you need to calculate these two stage significantly increases the complexity of even solving the LP relaxation of those. Um, even if you assume independence and maybe probably the, the, the least, uh, uh, the, the more user-friendly uh, assumption on the demands that it's independent normal, it doesn't help much, right? Um, doesn't mean that it's hopeless. It doesn't really mean that it's hopeless. It, I think there still can be a, a way to to form out, to to work out a formulation that works. Uh, we had shown a similar hardness result for chance constraint, which we were able to circumvent by just combining with other approaches. Um, uh, these guys also had suggested again to compute some approximate to stage cost. Uh, and there, there are other approaches that people try to just essentially uh, estimate those costs by some Monte Carlo approaches recently. So I think there's still things that can be done to make a, make a formulation that works. It's just in this particular setting, it's probably not going to work, right? Um, and even the, the, the edge-based formulation, right? The regular um, formulation that says use or not an edge, uh, it's actually not clear how to, to do it very well. Uh, particularly for the, the 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 scenario case, so work out an edge-based formulation for the scenario case, uh, and ultimately the 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 goal that I had mentioned at the beginning, I want to combine sort of two-stage uh, and chance constraint versions of the problem. Um, so hopefully it was understandable the talk and uh, and and interesting for uh, for you guys, uh, and I'll take any questions uh, if there is any. Thank you very much, um, Ricardo. So I'm now going to unmute everybody and uh, we'll try just the approach of having people uh, interject with their questions and, and hope we'll see if that works. Um, so now everyone is unmuted. So if anyone has a question, they can uh, ask it directly. I guess I'll ask a question just to test things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so on your last slide, you mentioned this thing about uh, approximate two-stage cost. Yeah. So one of the things, maybe this is more of a comment and uh, partly qu question, partly comment. So one of the things that's done in the deterministic setting um, um, from for approximating things, this for instance, this problem is that uh, it's actually not so hard to to bound the number of times you have to sort of go back to the root. Uh, because you can do, you can estimate it by something like the total demand of the route divided by Q, uh, and that's a reasonably accurate estimate. Uh, if you do things like, I mean, take a random starting point. I mean, go from the root to a random point and then start following the route from there. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you have. Uh, I think the same thing should apply um, uh, in the stochastic case. Of course, it would it would be an approximation of how many times you're going back and force in the root, uh, but it would be a reasonably good approximation. Have you thought about that? So, I mean, one of the problems is, is that, I mean, if you're thinking about the problem, the original problem, then, then yeah, that, that may be doable. If you're thinking about how to solve the particular set partitioning formulation, uh, then approximation may not be 
too good of a thing because you need to actually have the exact uh, reduced costs to be able to get a, a valid bound. Um, so, I mean, it, it depends on how you define the, the problem, I guess, originally, right? Maybe, uh, I guess maybe that's, that's the issue, right? You can define the problem as using the approximate cost to begin with. And then you can maybe that that's something to do, right? So you, again, you define the problem a bit differently. I mean, uh, yeah, there is that, but also even if you use the approximate, right? So it would give you like a, I guess if I think about not using column generation, but instance, for instance, just theoretically using the ellipsoid method just as a lower bound kind of thing, yeah. uh, it would give you an approximate dual separation and you can still use that to get a sure yeah. lower bound in some kind of approximate solution. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I guess, yes, you, you could always get a lower bound. Um, the thing is, uh, at least from, from other, I mean, th there, ha there have been some other cases, not even just in the deterministic, where uh, I've tried a few of these things where you can actually um, try to stop early on, even if you don't have sort of the minimum reduced cost, really the, the minimum reduced cost guys, we have some approximate and get a lower bound based on that. So you could do that, but those types of things tend to not work well in practice, I guess that's the, the thing. Okay. Okay, are there other questions for, uh, for Ricardo? Again, we can, uh, you can unmute your own microphone and just interject with the question if you have one. Maybe I can ask a very naive question from someone who has, uh, you know, not, uh, not not studied these problems before. Um, you know, it seemed like there's a lot of, uh, of work on this very specific problem. Yep. Um, if you improve the, uh, the approach uh, for this problem, are there companies that would immediately sort of start using it? I mean, so what is the sort of level at which it becomes kind of like practical? Question: How far is this from something that that companies are already doing in practice and, and would be interested? In? Um, so I, I think that I mean the the exact yeah. approaches they're certainly very expensive to to be used in practice. Um, so, but it is uh, so the, the the thing that that uh, I believe happens is that. Uh, the techniques that have been developed for the exact approach, even for the deterministic version of the problem, um, they have been used to, to sort of um, develop some heuristics for the problem. If you don't actually need the, the exact sort of true optimal solution, um, they can be used sort of to, to, to enhance a few ideas to, to, to develop a little bit more practical algorithms. The exact approach is they're still too expensive. Um, and then the hope for this is that again, once you start considering the, these uh, these more realistic scenarios where you have uncertainty, it's that uh, the same things would happen, right? But at the moment, yeah, this is I think this is more of just a, an academic combinatorial optimization problem versus uh, actually being used. Okay, um, thanks. So again, uh, if there's any more questions, now is the last chance. And if not, then let's all thank uh, Ricardo for a nice talk. Thank you. Okay, so um, at this point, I will...